waiting for people to turn up. My name is Gerd Leonhard. I work as a futurist. I run a company called the Futures Agency. And I'm really happy to have today some really, really interesting people with me. Guys, come on up on stage here. Some really great people. A futurist, a uh, entrepreneur and tech innovator from, uh, from Kenya, um, in telecom media futurist expert, and a person that's dealing with in innovation in the biogenetics, uh, uh, bioinformation center, sorry, Rachel. So they'll be making an introduction shortly. The, the format of this event is going to be about uh, five minute presentations from each person. And then we have what we call a grilling session, which means that you can ask questions, any tough questions through Twitter. Uh, I have a Twitter feed here. The Twitter hashtag is, of course, uh, hashtag ITUworld113, third day today. Uh, if you want to tweet a question, you can do that using this hashtag. Uh, and I will try to answer the question in, uh, throughout the conversation. We're also going to have uh, questions to each other, and afterwards, after the first round, we have a 20-minute question and answer session and also a short poll to give you. So uh, let's dive right in, and of course, me being the keynote speaker and the moderator, I get to go first. <laughs> so I'm gonna have a presentation. Let's start with my first presentation, okay. Thank you. Put up the slides if you can. Okay, so basically the whole topic of the session is what's, what's happening in the network society. Uh, and my view is in a network society, there's two things that are starting to matter. One is that we're going from this idea of companies being networks rather than a network, like from NBC to YouTube, right? So companies are becoming networked. Also the empowerment of users, as you can see here with the fish, uh, this idea of saying that the user, the individual actually is starting to matter more than ever before, right, in a network society. And I think this is really quite hard, as you can, uh, you can see in this slide here, is that uh, uh, on a global level, we have this shift towards people having more empowerment through mobile devices and social media. For example, you can see the big uh, change in RIM in the business of BlackBerry, right, the consumerization of IT, is that all of a sudden people are using Blackberries a lot more than businesses. Uh, which is a huge shift for BlackBerry, and of course one of the major problems of their, and issues of their decline. So technology means empowerment, right, and, and a lot more than empowerment. As you can see here in the Arab Spring, as the CEO of Salesforce.com has said, is not just about the Arab Spring, it's about the corporate spring, right? Companies are changing, businesses are changing, is the way that we communicate. Most global, uh, global Fortune 100 companies have strong involvement on social networks which is actually quite difficult because as a big company, you're not really set up to involve or co have conversations that easily, especially if, if you're a bank, for example, or insurance companies. Now companies are becoming what I call uh, going from the empire to networks. There's a great movie that just came out from uh, Tiffany Schlein called uh, uh, Connected, the movie, that you should watch. It, ex it explains how companies are becoming networks, and this is of course a slide of Facebook, Facebook nearing one billion users. Uh, Facebook is the biggest country in the world very soon, just surpassed by China and I think India at this point. Uh, so very interesting companies are becoming companies where co-creation is the new sort of standard. Co-creation meaning that you outsource ideas. And uh, Juliana from Ushahidi will talk about what she's doing later. But crowdsourcing ideas, BMW is looking for designs on the internet. Uh, many pharma companies are putting out uh, ideas for the creation of new medication into public domain using uh, sites like uh, crowdsourcing mechanisms and so on. So co-creation is becoming sort of a new default, which runs against the idea of intellectual property and who owns what and those kind of things. Also very importantly, I do a lot of work in Brazil, Russia, uh, and other places like Indonesia. Clearly the future will be shaped in those countries. Uh, here in Europe, of course, we do have a crisis, uh, not just in Europe, but also other places. But basically, if we're looking at Brazil, Russia, China, that's where the future will be happening. And mobile phones are the tools of empowerment for consumers there. You can see, for example, that airtime is becoming a currency in many of those countries. You can trade airtime. We also have total convergence, uh, meaning that we no longer know what's online and offline. Uh, many people, for example, if you go to a clothes store today, you can tweet the dress that you're wearing and ask your friends for opinions. I mean, this is already reality, right? So we don't really know what's online and offline any longer. It's complete convergence. And basically, being offline is becoming a luxury. That is the new luxury, right? So if you're really rich, you're going to be offline because you have somebody else being online for you. Right? 
That goes for our kids. You know, our kids are growing up being people of the screen. Uh, this is a quote from Kevin Kelly, who says that no longer are we people of the book, we're people of the screen. Right? And this is true. I mean, there are screens everywhere, in the car, in the airport, in the airplane, in your bathroom, in your kitchen, and uh, very soon you can watch your recipes scroll by as you cook, right? I mean, people of the screen. And they consume entirely different, as you can see, for example, in the demise of the music business, 71% decline because of this kind of consumption. Uh, a point that uh, Simon will drive home in the next session, next five minutes, is that data is becoming the new oil. And I didn't make this up. It was uh, made up six or seven years ago by the American Marketing Association and by the European Commission, saying that basically what's happening is that the value of the data that we create is becoming so powerful that it will rival oil as a driving force. Right? Data companies, Google right, is a master of data mining, Facebook, companies like that, and basically we are shifting now in our world to what uh, Jeff Jarvis calls publicy. We're going from a world to where everybody that's doing anything in business is becoming somewhat a public person. I mean, everybody in this room is probably on LinkedIn or Facebook or Zinc, then Zinc, or <laughs> Zing or Twitter or so, right? We're becoming public by default, which is very scary, at the same time has various benefits that we're going to discuss in our session. I think there's a significant amount of uh, issues that will come here. So as you can see, my time has been cut off. So I'm going to take questions from the audience and from my colleagues here. Uh, is there any urgent uh, question in the audience? Is there a tweet, somebody with a concern, anyone? Anyone? No, then we start with my colleagues. Fire away if you have a question or a objection, dare you. you. You talked about the idea of data being the new oil. Do you want to just expand on that a little bit more and talk about what that might mean to the people in the room, the businesses they have. Yeah, I'll only make this very brief because uh, Simon's session is about this very issue in the next five minutes. But basically, the very fact that we're all generating data now, we're saying where we are, what we like, what we rate, uh, we give the thumbs up, we do the like button, all these things, so it basically <coughs> becomes a huge flow of information that is very valuable for companies. This is one reason that Facebook will do probably the biggest IPO ever, uh, because they have really powerful data about their users. And that data can be used to sell things or to market things, which is a $1 trillion economy. The telcos, of course, have data that they really haven't used much, and Simon will talk about that. So basically, that issue is a very, very big issue. And I think, in fact, there are wars fought over data. As you can see on the, on the internet, data is, is a real source of uh, good things and bad things, which we'll hope to talk about. Other questions? Let me see if there's any tweet here. Any of you? I, I've got one. Um, what are the implications for intellectual property with a networked, open, um, interconnected future? Very good question. <laughs> Thanks for throwing that ball to me. <laughs> I, I think basically what's happening is that uh, ownership is less important than access now. For example, if you can see what's happening in the music business, right? do we still need to own the record? It's enough if, if we can just click a button and listen to the music, right? So copyright is still very important and, of course, is crucial to a lot of things. But the way you monetize is not by selling a copy, right? The way you monetize is by providing access. Uh, the most successful service in the, in the movie business until yesterday, <laughs> when their stock plunged, was Netflix. Right? 22 million subscribers paying $10 for access. But would they buy a DVD? Maybe not, right? So I think what's happening with the idea of intellectual property and copyright is that we're going to see new embodiments of allowing people to use what we have, right? rather than keeping it back. Another question? Okay, a quick one for you. Um, should we try and fight against being too, many, too much people of the screen? Is it bad for us? Do we need some help in coming off this drug? Very good point. I, I didn't get to that point, but I think uh, we're going to see a lot of movement towards what I call a digital detox, right? which basically means that we're going offline to recuperate from the river of information. Right? So part of that thing is going to be uh, that essentially these tools are so cool and so new now, you know, iPhones, iPads, uh, uh, Android and so on, that everybody's using it. It's a bit like a toy. I think in five or ten years it, it becomes reality like, like uh, tap water or le electricity, right? And then we'll mellow down, I think, in the abuse of this. Right? But clearly there are significant issues about addiction and, and all these kind of things that we're going to have to face. Right? But let me remind you of one important fact, of course. Television didn't fare any better. Right? I mean, people are truly addicted to television, and it's truly bad. Right? So compared to that, the internet is still doing pretty good. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, there's a question from Twitter. Um, mobile phones are the tools of empowerment for consumers. What about telecenters? I don't know the answer to that. That's a very good question. The telecenters don't seem to be the tool of empowerment, but um, maybe we can reserve that question for later and see if we can answer it. Do we have another question? How do we end users benefit from their data if it is not the new oil? Yeah. Very good question. Yeah. Anybody want to answer? Well, they can't. I mean, a lot of the legislation at the moment is potentially pushing no data to be recorded and no da data to be kept. So you get into a very bad situation within certain directions that the law might go in. So we, I'll come on to that in a second. Yeah, I think one of the key issues about data is I think telecoms and operators and ISPs have to be much more proactive about how to use that data, how to mine it, what to be permitted, what they do with it, how they collect it, how they use APIs. We're going to talk about APIs later. I think uh, open APIs are crucial to the process of the overall ecosystem, which uh, Juliana will talk about. But I gotta get off the stage now, because I'm the moderator, not the main speaker. <laughs> so I'm gonna take the moderating seat and pass on to Simon Torrance. Uh, okay, Simon Torrance is a good friend of mine who is uh, probably one of the world leaders in telecom, future of telecom convergence and the discussion about what's gonna happen with telecoms. And he runs a company in London called uh, Telco 2.0. Uh, also runs great events on this topic, so I recommend you check it out. Simon, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gert. So um, I'm going to try and condense in five minutes uh, work that has been carried out by the World Economic Forum um, over the last 18 months. So it'll be an amazing feat of concision here. But uh, to build on Gert's point, how do we turn this new oil into a social and economic asset? And the work with the World Economic Forum has involved MIT, Harvard Law School, Microsoft, and many other uh, uh, people. And uh, they launched um, this concept last year in Davos. Uh, there's a new uh, white paper coming out this year in Davos. So this is the spirit of the times, the zeitgeist, if you like. This, this uh, cartoon captures it. It's free, but they sell your information. Are we happy with this situation? Are we happy? Do we know what Google, Facebook, Twitter, and all kinds of other organizations are doing with our data? Or are we stuck in a, a Stockholm syndrome, what criminal psychologists refer to when we get to love our captors and we don't mind what they do to us? So uh, how, do we d how do we understand what's going on? Well, we as individuals with the internet and mobile phones are generating more and more data um, that is uh, growing at huge exponential rate at the moment, and computing power is enabling us to do thing, interesting things with it. So our searches, our activities, our location, our purchases, our uh, interests, our social graphs, even my inside leg measurement has extreme value to uh, lots of different parties, and you can see some of them here. So personal data is everything I do and make online and in the world. Now, there are lots of people who mine this data, as you can see here, to, take, to make money out of it. Um, and uh, they, some of the data they use is volunteered by me, I opt into it, other is ob observed, and some is inferred, and they make use of it in different ways in terms of optimizing their operations, their CRM, uh, stopping, uh, enabling billing capabilities, uh, that's for internal use, uh, but they also use this uh, data for uh, sharing with others and making money out of it. So Google makes money from advertisers with my data. eBay makes money with my uh, personal data by my ratings that it sends back to merchants. Visa sells data about my payments history um, on petrol forecourts, Experian, and if I'm, if I'm looking to find a new partner, Match.com will take my data and try and match it with others. The context for my data is very important, though. It has different value at different times, depending on where I am. So today I'm a business person, uh, tomorrow evening I'll be a dad, and in the weekend I do naked skydiving. That has different value to different people at different times. The problem, of course, is that everybody wants to get hold of me, and they want to sell things to me. They're doing things to me which I don't know about. So today the problem is that with a situation like this, that the regulators potentially create laws that prevent the innovation that could happen if we could release this wonderful data. We have creepy situations with cookies. I'm not sure what's going on with my, my movement and my behavior on the internet. And the data is in silos. So today we have a, there are three actors we need to understand. The enterprise is private sector. The public sector, governments and, uh, uh, and uh, w the country that I live in, and me. Today we have inefficient flows of data, of rights, and of value. Most of the value from my data goes to enterprises, and I don't know about it. 
A small bit of value goes to the public sector in terms of data that, I'm, that I have to give to the to, to government and they make use of it, and a little bit comes back from, the, uh, from enterprises. So the World Economic Forum program has been, uh, I mentioned going for 18 months, it has three principles. Let's turn this on its head. Let's say that it is not Google's data or an enterprise data, it's your data, it's my data. I own that data or I have access control over that data. We can keep it safe for you, and most interesting, we can put it to work for you. We can put it to work for you. Now, if we could take those principles, then we can start to create a different type of ecosystem, one where we have more efficient flows of data, rights, and value. We turn it on its head. Me in the public sector, my social contract with the, with the, uh, the place that I live in starts to get better. The key bit in the middle here is what we might call personal data services. These are lockers. Uh, where my data is kept and looked after, after for me, a bit like banks with my money. Um, around that, there are brokers who help me to find people who want to interact with me in a way that I control. There are metadata services, um, and there are trust frameworks, which are legal and technical structures that control the governance of that. So, we have a choice. Do we want to live in a world of digital feudalism, where I don't own my own data, the lords of the manor are in control of everything, and I am essentially a data serf, or do we want the digital enlightenment? We have a bill of rights, we have a social contract, and there are incentives in place for me to share my data in an appropriate way um, based on property rights and effective strong laws. So my question is this, and during the panel we can discuss more about the practicalities of it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, that, that was a lot of stuff there. <laughs> the 30 seconds really got you going here. So do we have a question from the audience? Don't be shy. You know, we're in Switzerland. You can ask questions. We're neutral. Yeah. Anyone? Yeah? No? Down here. Do we have a question? We have a question. Of course, Yuri. Great. See a question from you. I know everybody in the audience here. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. My, my name is Yuri van Feest. Great talk. Uh, what will be the biggest inhibitors in your view if you envision this, uh, I, I think, very good future? Yeah, the, the biggest inhibitors are um, misguided laws and regulations um, that um, stifle innovation that could come from what I've described here um, and, uh, it, uh, and uh, are trying to act on the, on the behalf of, for the benefit of individuals and society but um, create second order consequences that they, that they haven't thought about. So we, uh, we had a, an event in uh, New York with the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission in America, and they were saying it's very difficult for government and reg legislators to keep up with the pace of technology innovation. So what we need to have is a, is a better dialogue with that, with that group as, as one. Maybe we can connect to the Twitter question here, which is uh, from a sixth grade uh, here that we're seeing on the feed, okay, uh, Evan McIntosh. What would be the best for the future in terms of economic justice? Sixth grade. Uh, this does this connect to data? I think it does. Right, anyone have a take on this? Uh, well, even though justice requires laws, effective laws, I guess, and um, economic justice. I mean, I guess what I've described here, where you invert from the enterprise being in charge, taking my data and trying to do things with it to me, we can turn that on its head. I'm in charge of my data. It's a bit like my my labour, and I can put it to use. So if you, could, if you think about it that way, it could create a greater sense of economic justice. Maybe we can do a quick instant poll. I mean, your people are on Facebook, right? I, I'm sure you're on Facebook. You can admit it's okay. Right? So let's ask a simple question. Okay, who here thinks that Facebook is doing economic justice with our data? In other words, are they giving us enough value for what we're doing? Are we getting justice from fa Facebook? I, I think so. Anyone think so? No? No? Okay. You all one lift your hand if you don't think we'll get justice from Facebook. One wow, that's, that's an interesting poll. Good point then, Simon. Yeah. One <laughs> you one hit a the, gold mine. Yeah, one of the issues with Facebook is, or one of the opportunities, is that is to not trap the data within one platform. So you also have a challenge of um, monopolies or oligopolies coming, coming to play here. But there are technology developments that are going on at the moment which can help you to take your data and export it elsewhere. So that technically that could be, that can be solved. And indeed, even Google have an internal project called the Data Liberation Front, which is looking at this and how they think more broadly about just creating walled gardens. 
Great, we have a question here. Let's get the microphone so we can get it onto the web stream. We're live, by the way, on the internet. Uh, I'm supposed to say this, you know, like we're on NBC or something, but uh, it's uh, world2011.itu.int uh, world uh, world is the address if you want to look at it while we're talking. There you go. It's not. Yeah, it's oh, on. There we go. So uh, relative to the question you just asked, I would observe that anyone who uses Facebook uh, feels that they are getting just value from Facebook. Since no one is mandating use of Facebook, the fact that you use it means that uh, you feel that you're getting greater value out of it than whatever value you may be giving up. And if you don't use it, then obviously you don't feel that way, but then you're not using it. So anyone who uses it, by definition, that is rational is getting value, and if they're not rational, then their opinion can't be uh, appropriately viewed. Rowit doesn't uh, agree. Okay, do you, do you want to some, comment on that, Rowit? Uh, somebody is, is making you use Facebook, but you Talk feel to like teenagers. There's a huge pressure on teenagers to be on Facebook because their friends are. That's how society gets organized. If you're 16, 17, 18, if you drop off the book, you drop out of your social circle. So you Whether you want not, you not be there, you have to. You just proved my point, which is that the total value that you receive as a teenager using Facebook is a reduction in social pressure from using it. But right? you it it's Pareto optimality. <laughs> okay, very good point. Let's go back to that in a second because uh, we have to stick a little bit to the format here. One more quick question, okay. Urgent question, I'm sure not about Facebook, I hope. Further, okay. uh, what is the impact in your perspective of innovation? What is the context between in innovation, development, and impact of privacy? Well, so what I just described turns privacy from a problem to an opportunity. Privacy is the issue and the problem. If you look at it from a different point of view, with the, own, the, the user is in control and in charge of their data, then you're creating a very different type of ecosystem. So in terms of the innovation, um, examples are, are a much better healthcare outcomes. If I'm incentivized to share more of my data, I could help uh, the government to reduce healthcare costs quite considerably. If I get insurance priced based on my behavior rather than my age and sex, I get better insurance services. Um, and uh, I can help traffic congestion in my town if I'm incentivized to give more data. So uh, the innovation is, I mean, those are th three very simple examples, but the innovation is, is considerable when you start to think about the implications of putting the user in control of their data and creating mechanisms for that data to be shared and exchanged and traded in a safe and secure way. I think the key answer is, you know, we, we have these conversations a lot with various clients and we talk about this issue of being open, right, and what should you do. I think the recipe is really quite simple and, of course, it's not a recipe, but it's open as much as possible. Uh, and also there's another flip side, you know, open creates attraction but sometimes you monetize when you get close, when you can close a little bit more. Right? What Google is doing essentially is playing this game of open and closed, you know, while Apple clearly is playing the game of closed. Right? So both games work. We'll come back to the question later. Um, I want to welcome now Rohit Talva. Rohit is uh, really great to have him here because he's a really, really spirited futurist. He runs a company called Fast Future Research in, in the UK. And he works with many people to define what their future is, especially in the telecom space uh, with conventions and travel. And he's got a, a long list of clients. So he's a very smart guy, so we're really happy to have him here. Thanks. Thank you, Gert. Um, yes, so, oh, we've had a distortion of my slides, never mind. Um, my, what we do as an organization is basically tackle difficult problems for organizations or the questions they don't really want to explore. So, for example, with the UK government, we've been exploring what happens when you can deliver the same effect as cocaine, but digitally? Does Apple, Microsoft, and Nintendo become the new drugs landscape? Uh, we're looking at what's the future of airports when people are going through in 10 minutes? How do they make money? So that's our, our concept. And what I'm going to share with you today is this issue of how will the network world transform, in this case, the travel experience? Just think about the airport environment today. Already, there's a whole series of technologies that are coming in, network technologies that will transform everything we do from arrival at the airport to boarding. And it, already there are things starting to, to become available. So for example, if my plane is delayed, I can already through personalization be made a special offer for a spa treatment, 
a retail opportunity, a retail discount, or a free meal. That's already there today, and we can see that very quickly these technologies will come in and transform the experience. Also, if you look at what's going on today, go to Copenhagen Airport, already things like augmented reality are transforming our experience through a networked environment. I can put my phone up around the airport, say I'm looking for a restaurant, it will tell me what restaurants are available, how far they are away, and what the ratings are from other users. If I go to Berlin, I can wave my phone over the Brandenburg Gate, and I can see effectively a video of what the, gate would, uh, what the Berlin Wall would have looked like had I been there at the time. Uh, also today, already if you go to, on, uh, to a Qantas flight anywhere in Australia, you use your frequent flyer card to check in, it's your boarding pass, it manages your entire experience in the airport. You also have a digital permanent bag tag, so when your, your, your suitcase boards the plane, it sends you a text message to say it's on board. I guess if also if you end up in Sao Paulo and it ends up in Las Vegas, it can tell you that the two of you have been separated. Uh, we also know that then what's coming next are a whole range of interface technologies that will again transform the way we c consume and book travel. So whether it's haptic technology gesture interfaces to which I can point at an outfit someone's wearing when I'm traveling and say, where's it from, how much does it cost, can I buy it, to touchable holograms that might give me a very different experience. So if I'm walking around the pyramids, I'm finally allowed to touch the mummy, the mummy and uh, what's called skin put now. So I won't even need a device to actually enter, to enter data and share information. I talked earlier about airports being transformed. As we shorten the time people spend to go from check-in to boarding, uh, we're, we're accelerating the rate at which airports go bankrupt because they're losing retail and uh, food and beverage revenues. So then we have to start to reinvent the airport and say, well, what could it be? And we have to start to think about the kind of leisure experiences we can create. The problem is with 20,000 or 20 million people going to our airports, we don't know what leisure experience we want. So the network model enables us to create a very personalized experience. I can now sit in an airport uh, and very soon literally be able to configure whatever environment I want to be in through a network model. I can take that network model from sitting in the lounge, waiting to get on the plane, I might decide that I want to be in an undersea world, and actually as I, send, as I board the plane, I'll take that same experience with me. So we're starting to personalize and, and create totally immersive experiences for people using the network technology. Uh, but take this a stage further. If you look at where the technology is going and you look at what's happening with actuators and stimulators, I'll not only be able to visualize someone else's experience when they travel, but I'll imagine that I'll actually be able to walk to work in the mornings with my headset on and feel the entire experience of going to the Taj Mahal, the sights, the sounds, the colors, the smells. On my way home, I might decide that actually what I want to do is to sit in the front row here at ITU and experience that. We'll, we'll start to create very powerful re ex experiences. But maybe we need to go a stage further, because what we know is because of cost pressures, environmental issues, we may not be able to travel at all in the future. And because of the advances going on in brain science and understanding the brain basically as a computer, at some point we'll be, allowed, we'll be able to actually download experiences. So I'll be able to download someone else's experience of having been to the Galapagos Islands. The difference between a virtual experience and an immersive one, though, is that I won't know that I didn't have that experience. I'll think it was mine. So put that in context. Imagine you're down, you can then start to download other people's experience. So you could download the experience of have, having had a night out with Angelina Jolie or Brad Pitt. The problem is when you go into work the following morning to boast about what a great night you have, Two of your colleagues call you a liar because they've also downloaded the same experience. Uh, now, we laugh about this, but if you look at the rate at which technology is moving, the rate at which all these areas of science are converging, we really are on this very interesting and, and potentially challenging journey from technology enabling the travel experience to technology replacing it through a virtual model to technology recreating it through an immersive one. Thank you. Downloading, downloading experiences. I like that. <laughs> I'm sure Apple has a patent on that. <laughs> um, but anyway, do we have any questions and any feedback on, on what Robert has shared? Uh, anyone? Anyone from the audience? We, we do have various tweets. Uh, most of them don't have much to do with the topic. But because it's important that we respond to the, to the, to the kids, uh, there is a question I want to go on first. First, that's uh, what about children without access to technology? What's, what's going to happen to them? Uh, Robert, do you want to respond to that? Well, 
the, the key thing here is that the cost of technology is falling quite dramatically. So we, we can now get laptops at $35 going out into India. You've got mobile phones for less than $2. I think we've got to stop talking about the cost of technology because the technology has almost fallen to the price where you could give it to every single citizen on the, on the planet. To me, it's no longer about the technology. It's about how you help people understand how it can enable your life, how it can enable you to have access and live the life you want not be a servant to the technology, but the technology be an enabler. If you look at what's going on in education in India, we know that 25% uh, of Indian school teachers don't even turn up on a daily basis. We know that the average Indian gets about seven years of education compared to about 14 for the average German. Uh, in order to move that forward, we can't possibly train enough teachers quickly enough. We're going to have to use technology to get it out to the villages and remote townships. The same with healthcare. You know, the chances are that if you have a health problem that needs surgery in an awful lot of remote parts of the country, your only hope is that you have a garage mechanic with a steady hand mm -hmm. who will, through video technology, be guided through the operation by a doctor maybe 200 miles away. So the technology is a critical enabler to, a, to changing social structure, to changing opportunity, and enabling people to participate in the world we're moving into. Right, can I ask a question? Um, how does the nature of education need to change to keep up with all this development? I, I think we're, we're starting to understand how people learn. Uh, and, and by that, we're starting to understand the barriers to learning. So if you look at some of the projects, like the Bright Star Project, where they've taken kids from a reading age of 7 to a reading age of 11 in just eight weeks, most of that is not teaching them to read. Most of that is about unraveling the barriers to learning. And then you can really accelerate it. And I think... That's what we've really got to do to, to, to accelerate learning, innovation, and cultural change in a lot of developing economies is start to bring in these accelerated learning processes, both for the kids coming through the system, but more importantly for the adults who are already in the system but at the moment have no opportunity for participation. And again, one of the, my, I'm a you know, passionate Indian. One of the things I'm concerned about is that we actually automate before we educate. I already see a number of manufacturers whenever I go who say, look, the next stage in our development isn't to grow our workforce, it's to automate more and to employ less people because we need to speed up, we need to cut our costs. You're seeing it happen in China. And so the real challenge is what happens to that workforce. If they, if, if they can't participate and they don't have an opportunity for a job, we have many, many more Arab Springs on the table. So we've got to start to change the way we educate, equip people for multiple careers, teach them how to learn much faster, and enable them to create their own destiny, in a sense. But you need education, you need development, you need support to make that happen. We have two questions that we should answer. One is from Peru. Hello, Peru. Do you think that open source Android is a better technology for the future of these virtual experiences? Do you have a take on that, any of you? Or I don't Robert, care. Start? You know, Android, you know, is here now, but the timescales I'm talking about, which are 30 to 40 years, it will be, you know, who knows what the technology platform will look like. It might be embedded in you. It might be a DNA platform. We don't even know what it's going to look like. So whether it's Android, it, probably Google will still be behind it. But, you know, uh, you know, Google are the biggest mobile phone company in the world, and up until eight weeks ago, they didn't ma manufacture a single one. So we know that there's certain players that look like they're going to dominate the story, but what the platform is, I think, is a lot less important than what services it provides to the end user. And I think um, to, to answer some of the school kids' uh, questions here, they, they, they should be asking their teachers, what training or education are you giving us in software development and code skills? Let's have Joanna chime in on this. Do you want to say something about this? Yeah, yeah I, I would just like to add on to that, that um, the, the, uh, the type of education uh, that needs to happen right now, uh, we really need to be teaching uh, the co computer literacy and not just com um, use of existing tools, but how do they make the next Facebook? How do they make, make the next Google? Uh, how uh, are, they, are they looking at uh, programming languages like Scratch from MIT Media Lab? Uh, that's really what is going to empower the current generation to build the tools of tomorrow. Because we can muse a, a lot about what is coming up, but we still need people to build these things. Um, to actually fulfill the, the needs that are upcoming in the next uh, couple of years. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think it's uh, important to note that I think the human factor will only increase in this process. Right? Th that's at least my view. Some people may, dis uh, may not agree with that. But we have a question back there that we should take, and then we should move on. We've with got the, a couple uh, of Twitter ones as well. That look yeah, great. okay, okay. We can't take all of them, but let's start back there. 
It's working. Hello. Yes. Um, Angelique Weeks, uh, Chairperson, Liberia Telecommunications Authority. Um, as a futurist, how far in the future do you look and do you base it on developments as you see them today to uh, predict where we'll go tomorrow? And with that, I ask then why even wonder about being in an airport? Because I look at nanotechnology, the Human Genome Project, and I think maybe in our lifetime, we might be able to say, beam me up, Scotty. Okay, uh, teleportation, who knows? I think you're, you're 100 to 200 years away from, from that, just because of some of the basic bits of science you've got to master. Uh, we could probably disassemble you. It's putting you back together again that's the, the tough bit. Uh, and, and God forbid that Rachel ends up looking like me on the other end. You know. um, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think that what you have to do is not look at a single future or predict a single future. What we try to do is to explore alternative scenarios and to look at the trends, the forces, the ideas that might shape the future and how they come together. So one scenario is that we end up in a world where you can't travel uh, because of environmental issues, because of cost pressures. Then you need the virtual and immersive experiences, and that might actually accelerate the develop of some, development of some of those things. Another scenario is we crack some of those issues, and people will still want the physical experience of travel. So you have to work on these things in parallel. You can't just put a single bet on. If you want a bad example of putting a bet on a single view of the future, it's the Eurozone. That's a fair weather system designed for only when countries are going well. It had no exit door. It had no mechanism for what happened when a country tried to borrow its way to greatness. And, and so now we've got this whole situation where the whole of Europe, possibly the global economy, is being held to ransom because we didn't have the smarts to think about alternative scenarios for how the, for how the Eurozone might, might pay out. If you wanted a better ar argument for why you need to do scenario thinking, the Eurozone is probably it, the best one you can find. Okay, I, I, I'll throw in a quick comment and then we have a question and go on to Rachel. Uh, my comment on the futurism question is that, that we don't deal with predictions, that that would be ridiculous, obviously, right? We, de we deal with foresights. So we try to basically develop scenarios that we think are likely uh, and you can do that in the next five, seven years, that's possible. Everything else beyond that will be harder, right? But it's really about foresights, which everyone has. Ask your kids, right? They have foresights. I'm going to take a question. Hi there. I wanted to ask how you envision the relationship between an airport and an airline changing in the future? This is a fascinating topic at the moment because the, the boundaries start to blur, the services start to blur. Uh, actually, the, the boundaries between what happens in a leisure center, a shopping center, an airport could all start to blur. Uh, who owns the experience? What the airport is physically could start to change if you look at new materials, some of what Rachel will talk to you about. We're entering into some really interesting territory. What we know at the moment is the challenge is coming because as we speed up your journey through the airport, you have less and less time to spend money on the things that keep the airport running. So we're almost accelerating the rate at which some airports are going to get to a financial crisis. So now we're having to do the next bit of thinking that says, well, what do you do after that? Uh, and the most important bit is you know, starting to conceive the different possible scenarios. Already, if you go to Singapore Airport, they're putting a vertical farm in. Uh, Schiphol Air Airport has a six-dimensional cinema, you know, testing out these leisure experiences. So saying, how do we create things where you actually want to come and spend time there? They have zones where you can test out different hobbies. It's people starting to re-envisage what the, the purpose is, what the civic role is, what the commercial role is of an airport in the world we're moving into. And I think you, know, you don't have a single view. You have to think in terms of different scenarios. I'd slightly take issue with Gert. I think you can think longer term. If you're building infrastructure, if you're trying to develop drugs policy or uh, military policy, you have to start to think in terms of 10, 20-year scenarios because it can take a generation or two to think about how you move forward. For example, if you were reinventing the UN now for the world we're moving into, there's no point trying to build it for the world we're in today. You have to think about power relationships, cultural relationships, geographic boundaries, and how they might change in the next five to 10 years, and design a UN that's gonna work in the world we're moving into, a much more evolving model than a, the one that's based on serving the world in 1945, which is what we have today. Okay, yeah, we have to cut short now. This, I mean, fascinating topic. Um, Fast Futures, right, is your website. Fast Futures. Lots more stuff there you can download, I think. Okay, so we're moving on now. We're going to, um, do you guys know the TED conference? 
okay? There's a, a great movie of Rachel Armstrong doing what she does, and, and I have to read this because it's, it's really far out. I mean, we're really going in the future now. Architecture and uh, Synthetic Biology. Uh, she's working on in, in Greenwich in London. Her research investigates the impact of advanced combined new technologies in homes and cities. And she is a senior TED fellow, which is quite an honor, I think. So we're really very lucky to have her with us today. So uh, go ahead. In the very near future, in a not too far away kind of place, a young woman gazes upwards. Can you hear me? No? <laughs> I'm a bit shorter than everyone else. <laughs> I'll start again. So in, in the very near future, in a not too far away kind of place, a young woman gazes upwards, contemplating her future. You see, she never really knew her mother because shortly after her second birthday, the space shuttle that brought her mother and seven other international astronauts home from a mission from Mars burned up on re-entry. Her father, an inventor, got married again this time to a terrible woman with two simply awful daughters. So the young woman spent as much time as she could with her father working on their smart home, which was all the rage. Smart homes were a measure of social esteem and environmental responsibility, and the young woman was t given the task of meeting zero carbon targets and recycling everything. This certainly kept her busy. Nobody knew the workings of the smart house better than she did since she'd customized many of its standard features. One day, the family was invited to go to an innovation ball that was being thrown by a handsome, newly divorced, middle-aged philanthropist. Of course, the stepmother and her two daughters got all dressed up to attract the attentions of the rich man. But the young woman really wasn't into getting all dolled up for a bloke, so she said she'd stay and mind the home instead. This was an odd thing to do, because the house could pretty much look after itself. Just as the young woman was looking forward to spending uninterrupted time with her favorite hobby, she realized that her father had left his smartphone behind. Perhaps strangely, the young woman had never used her father's smartphone. It was different to the kind of handheld device that you or I might recognize, as it took the form of a headset that could be operated simply by thinking. Although her conscience insisted that she should instantly return the smartphone to her father, the young woman's curiosity got the better of her and she tried the headset on. She was staggered by the new potential of the smart home when she hooked it up to the telecommunications system. As she downloaded an app with her thoughts, which changed the mood lighting according to her feelings, the young woman remembered that Arthur C. Clarke had once remarked that any sufficiently advanced technology was indistinguishable from magic. Believing, too, that at the heart of every technology was a wish, the young woman realized that these combined technologies had the power to make all her dreams come true. But this wasn't just true for herself. Everyone with the smart house and phone could make their own wishes a reality. She understood this was big. This was really big. The young woman simply had to go to the innovation ball and share the news with everyone. But she had absolutely nothing to wear. So she set her mind to work and downloaded an app from the footwear site and made a pair of shoes using the small home-based manufacturing system in the basement, which it originally built for making the custom parts for the smart house. She had no idea what color they should be, so she selected clear from the options menu and then chose glass as the material. Since the correct drivers for glass hadn't been installed, she decided instead to use some adhesive that had dried on heating and produced a lovely sparkly effect underneath the mood lighting, which was now responding spectacularly to her feelings. Proud of her glittering shoe, she decided to make a dress to match. She'd set a heart on a bulletproof spider silk one, which was full length and would need a lot of material. She ran to the kitchen cupboards that were full of special goat's milk shakes, laced with spiderweb protein. Her stepmother and sisters gorged themselves in these disgusting drinks to make themselves slim. She emptied out every packet and filled up the syringe drivers that spanned the viscous fluid into a beautiful garment. All she needed now was a lick of lipstick. The young lady noticed that the biofuel claddings, which had been kept, up, um, kept topped up with locally harvested algae, had made enough oil for a cosmetic base, so she fed some into a printer syringe. Then she added a bar of chocolate, because she was hungry, and hit the print button. No time or material remained to home manufacture a mode of transport, so the young woman dialed a cab. While she was waiting, she cleaned up the carbon footprint she'd made, 
She downloaded another rat to recycle the leftover materials and fed the bioreactor algae with a burst of carbon dioxide. The house glowed with a healthy hue, which was predictably green. Realizing she'd made surplus biofuel, she used it to pay for the electric limousine, which flashed the mood lights on arrival to let it know that it was waiting. The young woman reflected on these amazing things that were possible when data apps in the material world connected. At the innovation ball, she was able to offer proof of her ideas. She showed everyone her shoes, her dress, and told them how they too could benefit from the combination of smartphone and home in so many different ways. The news went viral over the social networks, and a combined technology that offered a new kind of magic reached the ears of the handsome, newly divorced middle-aged philanthropist who set up in business with her, shared a chocolate lipstick-flavored kiss, and they both achieved off-scale happiness. We have really arrived in the future now. This is pretty amazing. <coughs> Great talk. So I want to ask uh, who in the room knows what 3D printing is, three-dimensional printing? Right? And so I want to ask Rachel, how soon do you think this becomes a reality that we can, I mean, we can print 3D stuff now, but in this way, like print a suit or print an Apple, <laughs> maybe, uh, print an iPhone, 4G. Uh, how soon can we do this? Do you want to think you have to bend this yes, down a little? So, so uh, yes, <laughs> I must remember how short I am. Um, so, so essentially, I mean, I, I work with um, a, a range of practitioners um, from um, scientists to technologists to architects. Um, and at the beginning of this year, in January, we held um, what was called a, a, a wet um, a fabrication a laboratory um, experience, where we were using um, uh, self-organizing materials um, as, a, as a way of manufacturing you know, dynamic um, systems that could themselves um, uh, solve um, p uh, particular challenges. I mean, the, the basis of, of, of much of this is the, the, the NBIC convergence. I mean, many... Many of these um, uh, scenarios actually are based in a form of reality. I mean, so that's essentially what science fiction is. You take an aspect of reality and then you kind of weave many uh, uh, possibilities around it. I'm looking at you know, so social and cultural consequences of certain choices and, and, and use those scenarios then maybe to, to reinform the choices that you're making the here and now. So I, I think that you know, many of these things, you know, so we can print livers now, you know, we can print tissues, um, or we can um, you know, home manufacture certainly um, small objects scaling up um, to an architectural scale is a, another kind of challenge um, but I do think that this NBIC convergence, I don't know how many people have um, heard of that that's the nano bio info cogno um, uh, convergence and it's an idea that was a discussion uh, document in 2002 that was proposed by Roker and Bainbridge uh, for the NSF and essentially they said that there would be more human and economic benefits if we actually uh, form formed a unification of the sciences, um, and this would create um, a wealth of um, uh, cross-collaboration and um, innovation um, that would you know, fuel the next generation of, of, of industries and enterprises and, and, and transform society because of this. And this was actually taken up as a, as a policy document by the EU, um, and there have been um, sand pits that have been held both sides of the Atlantic, um, which are essentially these um, uh, uh, condensations of uh, super incredibly bright people uh, facing big challenges like um, artificial photosynthesis and trying to um, work together to uh, solve some of these, these big issues. Um, but when science does this, it actually starts looking forward, and that's actually not its traditional stronghold. Um, it normally likes to present um, uh, data as, as an empirical uh, value. And once science starts to look forward as to what could happen with artificial photosynthesis, because they haven't solved it yet, then you start to um, open up this field of, of innovation on equal footing to people like architects and engineers and, and people that aren't working with blue sky sciences. So I, I think it's creating a platform for innovation. So the, the, the 3D printing technologies, I think, are particularly um, a, a, a technology that actually looks at this information convergence where um, traditionally very separate media, such as um, it, it, uh, digital data and the biological and, and chemical and material worlds have, have, uh, can actually come together and are no longer separated. Sounds extremely disruptive. I think this is a good time for a poll. You know what a poll is, the way you get to use those fancy things that you have on your 
on your chairs, you know, those uh, look like mobile phones. Okay, uh, let's bring up the poll number one. Okay, the, the question is, I want you to answer, not us, because we don't know the answer. Okay, is technology having a positive effect on the future of the planet? And uh, can we bring up the poll slide? Oh, there is a poll slide, okay. Do you have the devices, everyone? Okay, how do we vote? Okay, well, you know what to do with the voting. So please vote, is technology having a positive effect on the future of the planet? One is yes, it's crucial to socioeconomic improvements. Two, no, it's adding to the challenges. And third, you don't know. Um, so there's a fourth one I would like to add, it's called it depends, but that's not available. <laughs> anyway, so please vote on the first three right now. Push the button and we'll, we can see a live, uh, live poll on this and then we have one more question for Rachel and then we proceed. Okay, uh, so uh, is that it? Are we finished with the poll? Yeah, that looks interesting. So 61% uh, believe that it's crucial to socioeconomic improvement. So of course we're all in the tech business, right? So <laughs> I guess we have to believe that. But uh, very good poll to, to see. And, and of course a significant number of people who think that it's a challenge, right? So it's, uh, I think five years ago it would have looked a little bit different. We should pick it up in the, in the conversation later, okay? Um, let's go back to, um, to Rachel for one more question, and then we'll proceed to, um, to, the, to the last speaker here. Okay, um, so we're getting some good feedback here from Twitter. Anybody have a question for Rachel at this point? Yeah, you guys have already asked questions. Aren't you? <laughs> you can ask again, but anyone else want to ask a question? Okay, okay, then we go to Yuri. Yeah, we'll go right here. You don't have to use Twitter to ask a question, you know? It's okay. Uh, every technology is neutral can be positive or negative, and every new technology generates issues about privacy, security, spam, discrimination, and access. So if we look, look at singularity or, or bio, nano, nano, AI, robotics, the computer interfaces, what is, in your view, the biggest concern? Is it privacy, security, spam, access, or discrimination? And which specific technology? Thanks. Okay, that's a, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I believe that technology is, is not a thing or a, a system. It's the way in which our minds become embodied in the process of problem solving. So I think that the biggest obstacle that we face is one where we're actually not all talking to each other and, and finding a common vision um, so that we can together uh, face the, the, the biggest challenges, you know, so poverty, uh, food distribution, certainly the growth of cities coming up in, in this century is, is, is a major challenge. And what we've got are a lot of people going off on their own private projects and really not talking to other people. So we're going to end up with city computers that are completely different operating systems, um, you know, in, in, in different parts of the world. And I, I think that's really squandering our resources. So um, we, we have great minds, um, but, I, but I think they're even greater when they're connected. There's a question that relates to this here that came through Twitter from, from the kids. Uh, it says, the kids are ready to try this out all the way. I'm sure they are. Uh, what do you see happening in your lifetime about all the things that you mentioned? What's going to happen in, in our, I mean, pretty long lifetime really for us still, but what do you, what do you see happening in the next, say, 20, 30 years? I, I'll see, I see that we're going to have a, a much broader home-based manufacturing platform, being able to uh, produce things that we that we consume and recycle at home. Um, but there'll be everyday items, ones that we would normally purchase in, in shops. Um, uh, so, so, so things like um, uh, materials, for example. Maybe we will be making our own shoes and dresses. Um, the other thing is I think that we will be seeing a lot more synthetic biology as being part of um, our home environment um, where we're actually designing and engineering um, with our um, plants. There'll be a kind of gardening, but the gardens will be coming more in, in interior and they'll be helping us um, uh, manage um, the health of our environment. So I, I certainly see living buildings and, and living interiors. I was going to say that, um, going back to what I said at the end of my talk, is that we need a digital enlightenment, a new social contract, because currently the laws and the structures and the way we work are not up to the fast pace of technology. So that's a key enabler. So now we go from downloading experience to a new social contract. We're going to reinvent the world in this session. That's good. Keep tweeting. That's, that's a key statement, actually. I think the, uh, the new social contract, uh, definitely so, especially when talking about data, right? Moment. The other thing is that obviously pretty much everything Rachel's talked about, uh, the seeds of that are already out there, it's happening, but they're also the seeds of destruction and reinvention of almost every industry. 
Uh, we're talking about transforming manufacturing, no longer having big plants, but downloading the data and having the thing printed locally, having a 3D printing center in your local shopping center where you manufacture what you want while you're there. This is going to challenge literally every industry you can think of to, to change its business model, to rethink where it does production, to rethink how it does employment, to rethink what its role is in terms of value creation, its relationship with its shareholders. So you can imagine that there'll be a degree of resistance from an awful lot of industries to that kind of transformation. Great, so uh, we're going to move to our last speaker, and this is pretty amazing that we, we have uh, we have Juliana Rodic here with us from Ushahidi, straight from uh, Nairobi, Kenya. Okay, and there's one key sentence I think, you know, that uh, that I see in, in the description of Ushahidi, which we can easily remember, is build tools for democratizing information. And, and of course, it's a very good fit with our discussion about data, right? So it's a non-profit tech company that she's the co-founder of. Uh, and also, I think you're also a TED fellow, are you? Right? Okay, so we're, we have some influence there. So come on up and... Uh, Enlighten us. Thanks. So I really should have worn my um, USB earrings. That was just an amazing session. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today is uh, just a little bit of, like he said, just uh, some thoughts around the future. Um, so talking about filter bubbles, smart cities, and I meant to remove the dumb part, but really just crowds and how we uh, deal with data, how we share data, how we um, consume data. So uh, coming from Kenya, we've, uh, we've seen the transformation of uh, the uh, use of mobile phones. Uh, in 2007, uh, there were just uh, about 27,000 uh, mobile subscribers for mobile money uh, system, and now they're about 17 million, and there's about $475 uh, million worth of deposits in just a few months' time. So we're really seeing a lot of, sorry, that's going really quickly. Uh, so there's the idea of, okay, uh, Ellie Paris uh, talked about the filter bubble and the idea that uh, we are consuming data and we have so many choices around personalization and uh, we're creating silos of these personal data points. And the question is whether we are opening ourselves up to learning about others, or are we just going to be in this one bubble of the things that we prefer and not really seeing what's out there. The other thing that's happening is uh, the sensor networks, the idea of connected sensors. We're talking about visions of a connected future, and this includes devices. The Tower Bridge in London tweets every time it opens and closes. Now, we're not only talking about a future of data where we are the data points, we have devices pushing data into this network. That future is going to include, uh, go, to, go ahead and go to the next one, um, sensors that could possibly give us information that could be useful to us. This is an example of the Copenhagen wheel. Um, the red bit contains GPS sensors and sensors for particulate matter in the air. So it can give us information about pollution. So when you're cycling to work, you know about the air quality. Um, so, and then the next slide, please. Um, someone mentioned augmented reality, and this is a way to contextualize our world. Uh, and to get many data points about uh, what is in uh, our environment, uh, the services that are available, and uh, our ex uh, the proximity to those services. So um, as we join this part of the connected future, the question is, um, what sort of future are we really looking to? Uh, when these two ideas of, let's say, crowdsourced data and sensor data merge, are we looking at a future where uh, these two things serve us, or are we just going to have smart cities and people who are not really consuming data in a very useful way? Because uh, you, you may know about the climate change problem, but how are you contributing to alleviating it? Are you recycling? Are you getting a, a text message to tell you that this is uh, what you need to recycle on Mondays or Wednesdays? How are we 
going to design the services of the future. That way, the data that is the new oil or the identity systems that we're creating actually make sense or else we will just end up with silos and filter bubbles. And um, intelligence that is uh, sitting in big servers of big companies or urban OSs that do, do not have a relationship with us as individuals and a relationship with us as um, actors in this environment. Uh, as part of Ushahidi, we're seeing something around collaborative problem solving. This is a citizen map in Hong Kong that takes information about environmental problems, waste dumping, land development, uh, vegetation removal. And that's the first step. It's sort of like an alcoholic. The, the first step in, um, uh, in knowing what the problem is is to gather data and to acknowledge that you have a, a, um, an environmental problem. And you'll see a lot of glossy, beautiful uh, videos about smart cities. But the question is, what about you as the citizen in the city? The question is, you are the, the uh, provocation by Adam Greenfield, um, he's one of the proprietors of Urban Scale, looks at those ideas of leapfrogging, using technology uh, to bring that data from the city and making it relevant to you and me. And that's how we can leapfrog, leapfrog and take uh, the technologies that are here now to take us into the future that makes sense. Um, and uh, really, I, I'll just end there by saying thank you very much for your kind attention. And that's what I wanted to share with you. Okay, so um, let me switch to this microphone, please. Uh, do, do we have questions for, stay there where you are. <laughs> uh, do we have questions from the audience or important tweets or anything for Juliana? Anybody here? Or? Question here? Okay, we have a question right there. Uh, can you give us a web address, Juliana, where we can find out more? Just ushahidi.com, right? Yes, ushahidi.com or crowdmap.com. Okay. Ready for your question? Uh, yes, you are all very optimistic, except for the last speaker, <laughs> and I wish the last speaker is wrong, but, but I see no way not to be still more pessimistic than she is, and I will just display, propose you some of the reasons why uh, black scenarios are might be more likely than rosy scenarios. Uh, between 1848 and 1914, 66 years have elapsed. And this has been a time of technological boom and democratic, uh, let's say, euphoria. And then came 1914, first act, and 1939, second act. So this is already one might wonder whether we are immune. I do not mean that it is certain. I just mean that they did not believe either that it would end that way. They were not stupid. I read a lot of books on, of that period. They were not more stupid than we are. And they were not less ethical. And it was the prime time for technological leapfrogging. Second thing is that in the past quarter of a century, all the slums of the world have been covered with TV antennas. And it has changed the world, but it does, has not made people necessarily less poor. And I will just uh, conclude with three short, very short, inst instant express scenarios. If we go on the way we expect, we hope, it means that in a few years, we'll all be omniscient. We will all be Nobel Prize winners. We will be 9 billion, 10 billion Nobel, virtual potential Nobel Prize winners on Earth. We will have absolute knowledge at the press of a button. Then people will think, then what? And this is already what young people start thinking. What the point? And that's the reason youngsters have a very, very negative attitude towards school. They rely that in the best case, they will be one 
out of 10 billion Nobel, potential Nobel Prize winners. The second thing, second thing, it will be another two very short scenario. Once we are such geniuses on Earth, 10 billions or 9 billions or 7 billion, whatever, it means that we have very fascinating things to tell all the rest of mankind. So if you div divide the time of a life by the time you try to get the attention of whole mankind, it means each of us has one-tenth of a second in a whole lifetime to address his great thoughts to the rest of mankind. Of course, you might be less ambitious and just try to get the attention of one person. It is called marriage, and it always ends very sore. And the third point, the third point is that in, in my youth, a time you have not known, and probably your grandmother either. I'm very old. In the time of my youth, it was a very, the meaning of life, it makes me, people smile, meaning of life. But the meaning of life was very clear. You had to be a good citizen and study and become knowledgeable, and then you will push knowledge further, and you will have your statue in front of the science faculty. But again, again, if everybody is potentially that at the press of a button, it takes the dream from our vision of the world. So what is the purpose of life when everybody is a Nobel Prize winner before being born? Yeah. Wow, okay. Um, there, there are some concerns here. Who wants to answer here? Yeah, Juliana, since it's your turn. I, that was nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think um, y you, you make a good point about uh, this opportunity to truly use technology to affect people's lives in a very positive manner. I think uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, uh, we, we are seeing a lot of progress. However, uh, in slum areas, uh, I come from Kenya and there's an area called the uh, Kibera. The question is, how is technology helping to transform those lives? Uh, when, when you walk outside, uh, are they able to get information on their cell phones on water quality or locations of uh, you know, services in the community? I think, um, am I sort of, are we, am I? Not quite, because the progress needs a diabolic purpose. <laughs> you need someone in need, and you need a hero who wants to pass the victory at the end. Okay, let me, and I think let the me community can be a hero. <laughs> Okay, let's, let's move on. I, I just want to ask you guys briefly, I mean, if we're all optimists, you know, why, I, why are you optimistic? I, I'll give you a short hint why I'm optimistic, because I'm the moderator, I can talk forever. No, uh, then it's your turn. So basically, I, I'm optimistic, right? I'm very optimistic, because I think for the first time now, we see because of what's happening with technology is it's much harder to lie. Right? It's becoming very difficult to lie, because you can always check up on things, and it's much more transparent, and WikiLeaks has taken it to the very extreme, right? But it's very, it's very hard to lie now, right? And for that reason, I think that we're also seeing those problems now because it's becoming much more in the open, right? And that is my hope because we can't lie as much that we're forced to actually do something, right? That, that is why I'm optimistic. You guys want to contribute to that? As a yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll make a comment. I think um, uh, what you're touching on is some very important philosophical questions that need to be matched into the debate on from a technical and a commercial and a... Uh, you know, public service uh, point of view as well. But uh, I do feel we're a bit like, as I said, back in the time of enlightenment, where we do need some radical rethinking of what's our purpose and how do we interact and so on. And you can look back in history and find other moments of, of dramatic change, for example, in the United States when they created the Bill of Rights and they created a new contract with their people. That needs to be refreshed um, continually. But I do, I'm, I'm put, I voted in the unsure about the, the impact, of t the positive impact of technology because for the similar reasons that you... Uh, raised there, because we don't know, but we do need a much more informed and creative and multidisciplinary debate about those issues that you raised. A couple of things. One keep, is, keep it short, yeah. you, you talked about sure. Nobel Prize. That was born in the era where information was scarce, and we wanted to reward those who made the, the breakthroughs that moved society on. In the world of the singularity that you're talking about, where 10 billion are connected in the global brain, we'll be creating and collaborating in different ways. The Nobel Prize will have moved on as well. We'll, we'll be rewarding different things. We'll have different challenges. And, and you can't assume that society itself and its concepts won't have changed. Secondly, what's wrong with a collapse? You know, throughout history, 
we've had periods of breakdown. You mentioned 1914, 1939, we had in between the Great Depression. Sometimes you need those breakdowns. I think the arrogance of our era is that we thought we'd broken economics. We thought we had this long boom, and, and by you know, manipulating things, manipulating money, we could somehow you know, ensure a golden future. I think you actually now need the system to break down and have some total collapse to come through with the next version of capitalism, the next version of education, the next set of models, some of which are, are, are rooted in the ideas we've all talked about. Okay, Rachel, do you want to comment? Uh, I'm, I'm definitely optimistic, and I think that the golden age is coming where we're changing the models of um, the way that we think about the world from being hierarchical, Cartesian, object-centered, industrial ones to systems-based analysis. And actually, um, I think that in the last 20 years, we've had a generation of people um, who have actually systems thinkers. The Internet has forced us to be um, appreciative of a systems-based world. Um, and so I think that the impact of that is through open, global, connected, systems and if there has to be a, a big bad thing I think it's the city um, because it is essentially founded on industrial mechanisms and infrastructures that are incredibly static and that is our challenge and we don't have really much time um, in, in order to create humane contexts for the um, expansion of the population that we're expecting this century. Juliana, do you, do you have a take on this? Why are you an, are you an optimist? You are an optimist, right? I actually am. You have to be an optimist. Yeah, I, I, uh, despite my kind of dark uh, <laughs> presentation, um, I am actually an optimist because uh, coming from, from Kenya, and I'm seeing a lot of uh, innovation because uh, when we talk about technology, uh, I think Kevin Kelly talked ab about this idea of the technium where you have... Uh, the technology and then you also have the human factor and the processes that need to work in concert with the technology to, to really advance things. And uh, in Africa and uh, specifically in Kenya and in East Africa, we are seeing startups that are localizing uh, and making uh, applications that so solve local problems. And I think that is extremely uh, empowering and inspiring to myself and others, uh, because we're, we're taking these ideas that we see around the world and making them our own. Uh, and I think um, there'll be more interesting innovations coming down the pike that actually serve those local needs that I don't have uh, uh, a preview of just yet. Maybe I can amend my earlier statement because uh, about being optimist. Yeah, I'm also an optimist because I think and I, I see that most of the really strong innovation and, and, and new stuff will come from Africa, Brazil, Russia, Indonesia, China. They will not come from us. Uh, or maybe we can contribute a little bit. Right? But is that a question? Okay, can we get the microphone? Okay. It's coming, okay. Hi, I'm Royston from Grameen in India. And, and i like to sort of echo what Juliana talked about in the Kibera slums with 400 million people in poverty in India still. And, uh, you know, one really keeps thinking, and I like the comment uh, which was made earlier about technology and this utility with the human person because, you know, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And I think that comes to the philosophical question. Uh, you know, are we, are we moving to a solution or are we creating more of problems? And, and therefore, I would try to see how are we looking at technology in really creating happier people? Are we finding the need for you know, a bus to happen uh, and, and then something good will come out of it, but the poor people are getting impacted every time and, and the richer cremelia tend to sort of ride all the crisis, but the suicides and the crisis keep hitting the poorest of the poor. And we seem uh, you know, to be learning at the cost of the poor people. So how do we really integrate uh, you know, different strata of society in this great leapfrogging? Maybe I could quote uh, the original futurist, Marshall McLuhan, right, who said that the global village, 1971 is when he said this, right, the global village is not a world of peace, harmony, and quiet, is a, is a world of considerable uh, conservation, discussion, and chaos. Uh, and that's what we have now. We have a global village. I want to move to a poll, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go back to the discussion in just a minute, okay? Uh, this is actually a very good fitting poll now, right, uh, going back to the, uh, the second question. So what effect will the next generation of human-computer interfaces have on society? We heard about, a lot about these things in pretty much every single conversation, right? Uh, and if you want to really know about this stuff, you should watch Ray Kurzweil's movie on, on, the, uh, on the singularity, which will blow your mind in, in regards to that topic, right? But anyway, uh, human-computer interfaces, what effect will it have on society? You have your clickers ready, please. One, it will improve. Two, it will undermine society. 
third for the WIMS, it's too early to say. So please push the button and contribute your votes. I think we're also webcasting this all over the place. Okay, keep voting. You can only vote once, you know. No. Okay, we still have more optimists, but maybe the pessimists have increased, uh, and the other one is too early to say. Well, I think there's a very interesting debate about this, and hopefully it will continue. Um, we have one thing I'm gonna ask the speakers at the end of the session, and we, we will take another question or two. And personally, I still have more questions about Ushahidi. But there's one thing I want to ask the, the uh, speakers before we close so you can prepare what you're going to say, okay? Um, what is one idea or what needs to happen in order to get us closer to a position where every global citizen has meaningful access to connected technology? So what has to happen so that every person can have meaningful access? You define what that means, right? And you're supposed to answer with less than 140 characters because you know we're, we're dominated by Twitter in this conversation. So uh, just keep this with you for a sec. There was a question earlier. Okay. Okay. If somebody else, yeah, okay, let's start in the back. You know, if you ask two questions, you have to make a payment. You know. Hi. Um, I was wondering, listening to all five of you, it seems like there's a narrative that comes through if uh, if we take each one. If we are going towards a system, and if we look at the internet as a system, and we look at Roy's uh, vision of the future, where we can choose our experience. Uh, in where we want to immerse ourselves. We can make things without leaving the house. Uh, our data is used to know us better. And so Google serves up the, the information that best suits us. And Amazon gives us the books of people like me who have read the same book. Our, and if I listen to what Julia said, and I think that was the dark part that you started to talk about, is this enormous bubble of uh, confirmation bias, cognitive bias, which we kind of start going with affinity and we lose the serendipity of discovery. And data, instead of being enriching, becomes impoverishing. Yeah, serendipity is an issue. Any, anybody wants to comment on this or? I, I, didn't, quite, I didn't quite understand. What, why, why, is it, why is that the case? Can you hear me? Uh, the idea being that basically I get all of the data of things that my affinities, only people who think like me, people who have read the same books as I do, I will get those kind of suggestions. Instead of discovering new sources of information, I'm getting confirmation bias of the opinions and ideas I already hold are served back to me by Google, Amazon, the experiences I choose. And, and if you talk to academics, you're already seeing some of that. Absolutely. The kids in the classroom and in the university lab uh, lectures uh, uh, have a tiny attention span and are really only listening for things that are very similar to what they already know. And, and so they, they're applying that filter. And, and it's, again, about changing the way we learn and encouraging people to just relax, kick back, think, and value serendipity. And I think there's, there's some bits that have to go with the technological development, which is about social development and, and kind of getting people to just reconceive what society's for and what a life is for before you just drown them in the data and the technology. Um, I think... Uh We've also seen that in um, political debates in the US where uh, you had sort of people in the left really talking in these bubbles and the people in the right, uh, particularly uh, I think Ethan Zuckerman and his team at the Berkman Center did some research around that type of interaction. So it, it, you're truly right around um, the idea of serendipity and then also the, the types of friends that you have on Facebook. If you have just, um, if that's your media stream of the types of information that you're getting, then you've already closed yourself off to um, other views. If you, let's say you don't have any Muslim friends, then you may not know that the, they were paying attention to some uh, ridiculous comments that were made by uh, a US leader about Muslims. So um, it's, it's really a worry and a challenge to uh, platform builders and uh, the, the people who are making the technology of the future, how do we build in serendipity? Mm -hmm. And I think um, there's also the, I, the issue of feedback loops. They're very, very powerful. F um, feedback loops are, are powerful and are being used by Facebook and other organizations to make you uh, repeat behavior that helps them get more data. The question is how do you use these feed feedback loops for positive uh, ways of tackling the big issues that we have. I think
think these are really open and important questions that uh, bear uh, exploration and thinking about. C can I just add as well, I think that we're at the very earliest um, part of our um, engagement with data. I mean, data becomes information, becomes wisdom, becomes culture. And, and we, we've only really just started on that um, uh, journey. And I think we're over-obsessed with data and its amazing potential. I mean, there's data everywhere. Now, what, what we haven't learned to do is to actually, um, you know, use that, socialize it, culturally connected in, into kind of mature forms of wisdom. So Facebook and, and all these software apps, they're, they're, they're like, you, you know, kind of, cutting into uh, tablets of stone, as it were, and just starting to explore tools of writing and self-expression that will emerge from this. So I, I definitely don't think we're going to get stuck in this. Data is actually meaningless without a, a meaningful context. Um, so I, I, I don't worry about it too much. I think that there's a lot of time lag in, in what we're seeing. Um, and, and, and I think that you know, uh, um, our communities um, will, will adjust to, to this complete overload. And that's, I think that's why we're you know, shutting down our filters. But Will we adapt? Yeah, I think um, uh, humans are creatures of habit, and um, many studies show that if you observe an individual over the course of a couple of weeks um, closely, you can, um, you can predict almost 95% of their behavior the week after. So we are creatures of habit. We like comfort things. That's why we spend, or Americans spend, seven hours a day on front of t TVs. Um, but I think, as, um, as we were just hearing, that um, the opportunity, if you can release the data and innovate on top of it, is, uh, is unimaginable. You know, if I can get cheaper insurance because it tracks my behavior, that's, that's good for me. Yeah. But the public benefit of mashing up my personal data in a way that I'm comfortable with, with government data and other people's data, you know, it's unimaginable the, 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 uh, in, uh, the efficiencies and the good you could potentially do with that. So it's not just about getting personalized you know, books that I like from Amazon. It's about reducing inefficiencies in everyday business processes that go on um, and unleashing um, creativity that we haven't thought of today. Okay, we have to wrap up within five minutes. There was one, you still have the question? Yes. Okay, there's one, one question, and then we're going to get to your Twitter statement. So <laughs> you have to count the characters and what you're going to say. Okay. Another one minute, two, three, uh, well, we're going to take this question first and then. So, uh, this is a little bit breaking news, but I guess uh, Eric Brynjolfsson from MIT uh, either just came out or is about to come out with a book, and basically it was looking at the uh, productivity impacts of technology. Uh, allegedly, the conclusion of the book is the reverse, um, or to put it another way, uh, they ended up looking at the dark side, uh, and the, the basic point is that uh, automation uh, replaces human workers doing jobs, and I hate to be negative because I'm fundamentally an optimist, but you have to ask yourself with increasing automation contributing to increasing unemployment, uh, besides you know, short-term financial crises, uh, just as a general trend, uh, the implication would be that you know, in effect over time there's only one person working and they're so productive that you know, they have all the world's wealth and or that it needs to be redistributed. So just thoughts on Productivity, automation, and implications from a futurist scenario <laughs> perspective. <laughs> As okay, I said let's, earlier, let's keep it short, guys. We're there's that risk that there. we do automate before we educate, and that's why we have to start thinking much more about what society's for and what life's for. Just because technology's there and just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. I think we've heard this story before with Carol um, Karpich um, and the, the, the robots. Um, and we always catastrophize when there's change. That's what we do as humans. Now you get, you get your 40 seconds now, and, and then we're going to wrap up. Okay. Very seconds, quick, I'm counting. Ma man is an ani animal, animal of habit, but there are ways to break that habit and not read always the books we agree and not speak with the opinions we agree. And there are two very simple techniques. I am a journalist. When I try to get information, for instance, let's uh, say Grameen Bank. I will not only enter Grameen Bank on Google, I will enter criticism on Grameen Bank. And then I will discover very interesting minority-minded uh, 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 opinions, which usually are much more relevant. Uh, flea market. At the flea market, old books are not necessarily better than new ones, but at least you don't know in advance what book you are going to discover. These are two techniques which I use daily because I mistrust a lot my own opinions.
Uh -huh, okay, that's, that, I think that's the key point you're trying to say. <laughs> and so do I, that's a good, that's, that's a good attitude. Okay, uh, we're gonna wrap up. So we're gonna get to the Twitter messages now. Okay, the, the question is, what is one idea or what needs to happen to get us closer to a place where every global citizen has access to connected technology? Uh, you wanna start? Sure. Yeah? Uh, blanket the world with broadband or use the International Space Station as a giant wireless internet service provider. Okay. Uh, that was more than 140, but it was good. It's, it's less than 140. <laughs> ah, you already tweeted it. Okay, yeah. good, good. Keep it rolling. Okay. Um, telecoms is our most flexible social infrastructure that can help evolve our cities. Say, say that again so we can hit on the microphone. Telecoms is our most flexible social infrastructure that can help evolve our cities. Okay, thank you. Rohit? This is not about technology, it's about the opportunity and the lifestyles we want to create for everyone on the planet. Um, new social contract to inform our decisions and investments. I, I contribute mine as well. I did have time to think about it, you know, so uh, <laughs> I thought about it earlier too, I have to admit. But anyway, it's my, my short snippet is uh, less, not less than 140, is that I, th I think we must go from an ego system to an ecosystem, <laughs> and, and we're, we're just in the middle of that switch to where all that mattered for us, that's longer than 140, sorry. All that matters <laughs> for us was the profit or the growth, right? Now we're going from a system that's about an ecosystem, which is basically how to solve things together. And I think this is very much a telecom issue uh, and an ICT issue in the future. So I want to thank you very much. Uh, I think this we've, we've done all the chores we're supposed to do here. Um, thanks very much for coming by. I hope this is gonna be online so we can watch it, thanks.